And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Studio Hex, currently developing Hellborn, which we'll be getting into today. The one, the one and only Alcus Deli, also known as Fern. How are you doing today, man? Or tonight in your case? I'm, I'm doing pretty great. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a bit anxious. This is, since this is my first interview where I have to speak. The only other one I had in past was with a certain Mr. Dan Davenport of the random, of the random world's chat room. Yeah, I know him. But I'm, yeah, I'm very excited to be here nonetheless. Thank, thank you for coming on. So... A bit of a tradition is going into the origin story for for, pe for people when it comes to their des when it comes to their designs. So, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Oh, that's a long story. When I was around eight or nine years old, I was enamored with art and fantasy and everything fantasy related. I watched all all the Lord of the Rings films back to back even though I didn't understand anything, because they were in English. But my father noticed that I had a certain knack for the fantastical, and so he bought me a 3.5 monster manual he found online, and I was just infatuated. Although, because I was nine, I understood nothing. The rules were too complex, the writing was too verbose, even in Greek, and I just put it in, put it in the bookshelf and never read it until I... never read it again until I was like, what, 14? where I started watching videos about this game, Dungeons and & Dragons, and all the stories people had about it, and I was like, this game looks very interesting. Wait, did my father give me a book about that back then? And I started again, getting more into RPGs, bought some books, and started playing with a few friends. Over the years, I grew up a decent collection of RPG books, and found a solid group. And ever since then, uh, ever since then I've been infatuated with the concept of just Friends, being on a table, making their own stories, and playing a board game. Mm -hmm. Pretty cliche, though. I'm, it's, I'm still very fond of that. Well, things become cliche for a reason. Yeah, true. So, were you, were you, were you a one system guy, or did you experiment with a, with a bunch of different systems? At the start, I was a uh, one-system guy. I was like, oh, d and is great. I don't want to change. This is too good. But then I started getting into more settings and the games behind those settings. More specifically, I started getting into the world of, world of Darkness and Vampire the Masquerade. Mm -hmm. and I was like, well, this is good. This is nice. I really like this. It's a lot more roleplay based. And I started looking into more systems like Lancer. I got the World of the Apocalypse called Cthulhu, Cyberpunk, Hunter. And then... I just got a lot of books online, either through legal and illegal means, because <laughs> I'm poor. I can't afford $50 PDFs, unfortunately. Yep. Uh, although, since you mentioned World of Darkness, I hope I hope to God you didn't try and do, you didn't try and do a balanced run with Mage, because there is no such thing. You are mistaken. I am currently running a Mage Ascension game. You did. You didn't deny whether whether or not it's ba You didn't. You didn't say yes or no to the balanced part. It's not balanced. <laughs> Mage can never be balanced. Yeah, because it's only it's only it's only balanced through paradox and of course GM fiat. Although there are ways to break the whole paradox thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, though my players are none the wiser about that, and I'm kind of grateful about that. Well, hopefully they don't hear this show. They unfortunately will. <laughs> but it's it is it is interesting that you that you brought up that because when it came to what I saw in the in the preview document that you sent that you sent me for Hellborn, I was going to ask if World of Darkness was an in, was an influence because oh, I it absolutely saw, was. I saw a lot of it in the layout. Well, the layout was just because we found that. We found that layer to be the most comfortable. It allowed us to put a lot of content in there. We didn't get we didn't get inspiration from World of Darkness mm -hmm. from that. 
Yeah. We mostly got we mostly were inspiring all of darkness about the from the uh, in terms of the lore and the meta plot. Mm -hmm. And that that's where the biggest inspiration came from. Yeah. Also, sorry for dropping you. No, no worries. Um, although one of the th one of the things that's going to separate you is the fact that instead of rolling all the damn dice, your core mechanic, as I understand it, is a two d six. It is to d6, yes. Although you do roll a few other dice, mostly for damage or for tables. The core dice roll, the core dice rolls are two d6. Yeah, I I refer to I refer to that as the I refer to this kind of thing as the Rome effect because you know all roads lead to Rome, and yeah, if you look at the majority of um, tabletop RPGs, especially the ones that have come out in the, since the 2000s. There's always that one. There's always that one particular mecha particular mechanic that is ki is kind of the center point that everything spring everything springs from. Mm -hmm. um, that's as opposed to some of the early some of the early days when it, when there was still the miniature base where um, instead of one unified system there were a bunch of subsystems that maybe would intersect. Um, yeah, that's where that's where the indie began, after all. Yeah, and I th I think the now as as I understand now as I understand it, the two d six that you have is sum based. It isn't it isn't success based. Um, no, 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 no. It's sum based. Given that, given that, um, what w would you? Do you have it that um cri that criticals are what happens when it's either box ca box cars or snake eyes? Yeah, it's mostly because uh, I must go. I must preface that this is not the first edition of the system. We've done like three or four of them, and during the time where I was making this, the final edition, I was playing a lot of Disco Elysium. And, and my friends had also mentioned that rather than using D100, we should use something like D D12s or D two D6s, and I agreed, and I decided to use that. Yeah. Now, when it com when when it comes to when it comes to the my, the other thing that I f I found I found kind of interesting that you have that you have set up is the is the is some is some of the power systems that are um, present, um, such as well the big the the big one is the the big one is the path system, and have and having people essentially essentially create essentially um, multi class right out of the gate. Exactly, we figure that being a mercenary or being you know. That badass hard gun, hard killer, mastermind, whatever you want to be, it isn't just one set of abilities. It's multiple sets of abilities mm -hmm. that a single class cannot cover. We did try to have a class-based version of the game in previous editions, but I figured that it's not exactly what we're going for. Eventually, I decided to go with this sort of perk tree-based system. And what I f what I find interesting with it is that you ha is that you have you have you have mul you have multiple degrees of of importance with each, but because you're limited to four, it is not possible for you to have access to every tree. Yeah, because it's the the more uh, how can I explain this? Depending on which path it is, if it's your primary path, if it's your secondary path, if it's your tertiary path. It t it costs more and more to put uh, purchase perks on that path, mm -hmm. and, and thus it's expected that rarely will you able will you able to get everything from every one of your perk trees up until the end of the game. Because mm -hmm. let let me ch let me check let me check the total. So we so the total paths that we have, and I, and I think I, I think it's around like eight. Also, I must know that in the preview. We haven't added all of the th all of the things. Yeah. Where there's more races, more supernatural abilities. There's more subnetics. There's more paths, more perks. Mm -hmm. The other the other thing that I f that I noticed is the is the nature of boons and their relationship with cybernetics. Which in a I guess bo I guess boons would be the would be the 
closest to closest to spells. spells. And the other reason I bring I bring that up is the effect that's referred to as CES or cybernetic essence suppression does does remind me a bit of the relationship between essence and cyberware uh, in Shadowrun. In Shadowrun, exactly. We we, did, we took heavy inspiration from that because. One thing we wanted to incorporate one way into another was a sort of humanity system or some way to force players to have to balance out between cybernetics and supernatural power. Mm -hmm. We tried to do a standard humanity system where the more cybernetics you had, the weaker your willpower would become, the more insane you, you'd, probably be, you'd probably be, or the more you indulge in sin, the less human you'd be, and eventually you'd become a gigantic sin monstrosity. But I never found that it stuck. We thought that it was too reminiscent of Cyberpunk or too reminiscent of the Beast and the Whites from Vampire Masquerade. Mm -hmm. So eventually I figured out that this is the best way to go. It forces players to have to find that balance between having too many boons and having too many cybernetics or just going one edge or the other, either being fully cybernetic or fully chromed up and having many cybernetics or having no subnetics but having much stronger boons and being able to cast them a lot more often. And because of the way you have it set up, I don't think it would be um comp I don't think it would be out of out of the realm of possibility for somebody to use this approach to make the equivalent of a street sam. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Although I do I do appreciate that they that they are organized into tr into trees cuz that that is going to reduce the analysis paralysis that could that could happen. It's going to ha it that kind of thing is going to happen eventually, but you can always yeah. attempt to minimize it. The other thing I I couldn't help but notice is unless I unless I skipped something, which is cer is certainly possible. There's given how given how stuffed with info my head is at at any given point. There isn't exactly a um a resource that you're that you're using. The resource usually usually is time and and making sure that you have the um para the parameters for the te for the um technique. The one resource that you have to usually manage is darkness point, which is a sort of like mana. But that's mostly it. Otherwise, some abilities might need for you to have to lock eyes with the target, some require you to see them, others don't. There is no additional resource that you have to manage. Yeah. The... Now, when it, com when it comes to... When it, com when it comes to the... When it comes to the... Te when it comes to the way... The way, um, darkness points end up being utilized, um... Is it is it a case where you get them back after a scene change, or is or is it going to be one of those full rest kind of situations? Sort of. There is a downtime system, which essentially each downtime phase is around eight to twelve hours, where you can do one of multiple things. One of these being to recover, which uh, regenerates both hit points and darkness points. Usually within with, within one to two rests, you cover your entire pool. All right, I I can I can get that because if if it was if it was a, if it was one of those can't get, can't get it back until long rest I could then you you could potentially end up with the with um what's known as the rainy day paradox hmm. where some where somebody's saving something for a rainy day but that rainy day never comes or I can't use one of my ninety nine mega potions what if I what if I need them for later he says during <laughs> yeah, yeah. he says during the boss fight at the end of the campaign. Yeah, no, I get that, I get that. I mean, mostly you you get them in between missions unless something is ve unless there's like a very specific scenario. Okay, you escape from the heist, use all your darkness, but then you're in a car chase and then you're cornered. That's most of the situation you, where you wouldn't be able to recover them. Mm -hmm. Now, I've 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 kind of danced around it, but I I may as but I wanted I will tackle this particular thing head on. Um. What prompted you to t to take the uh, to take the approach that you got that you guys have regarding this um, cyberpunk infused hell? 
Well, originally, we just wanted to make a game about a cyberpunk hell. There wasn't much thought into it. We thought, we like, we are Satanists, yeah, we are members of the Satanic Temple. We like the set, the, we like the setting, we could fuse it with cyberpunk, we, we, we can fuse it with cyberpunk, we like things like Hasbin Hotel, Hell of a Boss, and cyberpunk. Why don't just make this? That was the original idea, really. It was spontaneous. Not much thought into it. Which certainly makes sense. And I'm out of curiosity. Has has anybody brought up some of the hell designs and say Doom to to you guys because of that mix of hell and cybernetics? That was actually one of our original uh, inspirations. Though we decided to stray away from that because Doom's cybernetic hell is a bit different. I don't know how to explain this. It feels a lot more futuristic, not entirely cyberpunk. I'd s Though other people have not come up and tell tell us that, I'd I will admit. I'd say it depend. I'd say it depends on what. I'd s to be quite honest, a lot of the, a lot of the cybernetics part when it comes to do when it comes to Doom, um, are seem to seem to be very seem to be very limited. Like if you look at a lot of the maps, even the hell maps in Doom, they're very castle oriented. Yeah. Way, yeah. Too, way too many of them are castles and. That's one of the, uh, the reasons more, the that people pick yeah, up the, the, the Peterson. Yeah, yeah. The cybernetic stuff only appear in the demons with like their giant laser cannons, so the jetpacks in the case of the revenants. It comes up nowhere else. Yeah, re revenants have it, revenants having jetpacks and those damn home and those damn homing missiles. Obviously, obviously the cyber demon, which um, you're supposed. They, you're supposed to rocket duel, but most but most people don't. They just they just use plasma cannons, or or, or they'll humiliate it using the BFG. But I just use I just use the shotgun. I just use the shotgun. Full lot of them. Um, but you don't see a whole lot of cybernetics with say cacos. Um, chain gunners are just are just zombie men, so that doesn't count. Or, or the arch vials. Yeah. And, the pain in the ass archivale. If they if they were cybernetic, that'd make them even worse. They're already, they're already nightmare fuel as it is. Yeah, in more ways than one. Um, is, I my introduction to Doom was fi was Final Doom, which which meant I ended up playing the Plutonia experiment before I should have. Mine was argue was arguably the one that most people had was Doom Eternal. Mostly because I couldn't play Doom anywhere else. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, the Plutonia experiment was was a was an extra episode for um, Doom Two as part as part of Final Doom and was notorious for being difficult. But it was it was difficult by design. The Casali brothers out, outright admitted, who and they, they were the ones who made it, that they wanted to make something that what that that was a new challenge for people who were already beaten. Doom Two on Ultra Violence. Oh, I see. Um, but it did, it did, it did put in a bit of a rule that I've had, and that is, anytime I'm playing a shooter, never play on the hardest difficulty because it's probably going to go past hard and into bullshit territory. It usually does. Speaking from experience, I mean, you have you have nightmare when it came when it came to old school Doom, where enemies constantly respawn. You have you have the you have you have the highest difficulties in most of the COD games, but especially World at War, where everybody throws grenades everywhere or, all the time. Or mein Lieben in Wolfenstein. Mm -hmm. Um. And I, and of co of course the, of course there's the infamous legendary when it comes to um, Halo Two. Halo. Fucking jackal snipers. Oh yeah, I've had I've had a few bad experiences with these, but actually not in the Vader games, but in a tabletop form in Halo. How's it called again? It has a stuff like Halo Mythic. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm familiar with that. Yeah, I I played around with a few friends. It was a very fun experience. I hate the jackals. Get in line. <laughs> I, I lost two characters back to back with that. There's a reason why in Halo Three they gave they gave the jackals these br these bright helmets. But the head the headshot beacons, as I like to call them. But to make it e to make it even worse, you could have done what my colleague had done and played Halo Two on Legendary in it in what is known as a lasso run. I, th 
think I know what you're talking about, though. I, my memory doesn't serve me right. Legendary All Skulls On. Ah. Anyhow. But, I sp but I, what's, what I do find very interesting with the approach that you, that you guys did is... A lot of a lot of games, whenever they utilize whenever they utilize hell, it is it is always very broad. It's never treated as a, as a full on world. That's not the case here. We also realize that I wanted to do something unique per se. And whereas more whereas more other settings would do a uh, large infinite hellscape. Full of brimstone, darkness, medieval castles and ruins. We decided to do the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. And that that is that is that is going to be vital because if, because it's it would be very difficult to do a hex crawl cyberpunk <laughs> to put to put yeah. it in, to put it in to put it in one way. How does it even work now that I think about it? Um. I think if I think if you had I think if you had a setting that leaned that leaned more into fantasy that just happened to have cybernetics the way thief is a fantasy setting that just happens to have electricity. Yeah, or like most D and D worlds, where artifices are present. Um, I really most of the unless I'm unless I'm running specific campaign settings, I usually have a, I usually have artifices in the. Not in the disallowed category. Understandable. Because really, they're they're they only f they only fit if you in settings like say Eberron. which is what they were designed for, after all. Oh, like if if you had an art if you had an artificer in in say Dark Sun, there would be problems. Plenty of problems. Uh, even more so in in Ravenloft. Uh, that's not to say you. That's not to say you can't. It's just that there's a certain. It's can it when ev when you're dealing with a dark ages. It's kind of hard to have a tinkerer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's not to say it's impossible. It's just a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Cer there are certainly ways to you know implement that. That is going to be challenging, to say the least. Mm -hmm. But. And it and. The one thing that I ended I ended up thinking of when it came when it came to the depiction of hell that we have here, even if it's not exactly the same, but the, but as a similar wave wavelength, are you familiar with the works of Wayne Barlow? Uh, if, if he's an author, can you name the books? He's not an author; he's an artist. Um. Uh, I don't think I am. If you can send me any of his, any of his pieces, I might recognize his style. But otherwise, I have not heard of him. Um, his his bit one of his bit one of the one of the more prevalent th the more prevalent things in this case is his depiction of hell, which is definitely unique. Um, I will send I will send you a link that has a few examples of the pieces he did. Let me see. Mm hmm. I see. I see. I haven't seen his works, though. Admittedly, they are ex they're beautiful pieces. Mm -hmm. I am an artist myself, not a great one. I I, I can only draw a pen and paper. Mm -hmm. His work looks amazing. Yeah, but the th the thing is, the reason I bring it up with in this case is a lot of the tip a lot of the typical trappings that people would assume with a hellscape don't really don't really apply. There is. There is a, there is certainly a culture within within his depiction. It's just one that is very um, bizarre. Bizarre, yeah, that's one way to put it. Oh. Ad admittedly, a lot of his, a lot of his stuff is concept art, and a lot of it is in the science fiction end of things. But yeah, his works do remind me a lot of H.R. Geiger or Giger. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> I think that's a, I think it's a potato potato thing. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, but and get, given given that given that I I know that there is a I know that there's a lot of a lot of lore when it comes to the when it comes to the when it comes to the factions when it comes to the corporations when it comes to the history of this of this hell depiction. Um, 
but I I am curious if for if for the sake of players you in the full book you plan on putting a brief a brief summary of some aspects of it, um, kind of a kind hmm. of a primer if you will. We have we don't have that we don't have that yet though now that you mention it it would be beneficial to have. We might write it if we have plenty of times, and the book is still a work in progress, even though everything is complete, from the formatting to the rules to the lore. Mm -hmm. We can go back and just add stuff, if need be. Yeah. And... I'm also, curi I'm also curious if, if um, give, given, the, given the very urban approach that, cy that Cyberpunk has, if, um, you, if in the full book you plan on giving a whole giving a whole lot more of a spotlight to the hollow. Uh, not necessarily. We do plan to... Uh, uh, a thing we do a lot is we write short stories set in the different cities of hell, and we do want to write a story set in that place. Otherwise, every city has an equal amount of focus. Mm -hmm. Which is, cer is certainly a, f a, fair, a fair way to, ta to tackle it. Yeah. And... Aside from aside from the hell part and, and some of the motif, some of the motifs within within there, would it be fair to me to say that a lot of the depiction would a lot of the tech level would be would be fairly modern sl slash bo slash borderline futuristic? Yeah, uh, the subnetics are in their own way futuristic, but we also have a special category of especially futuristic stuff, which is very powerful. It takes a huge toll on your essence, and it's also very expensive. Mm -hmm. In the preview, we purposely uh, uh, made that uh, put that area, covered that area with like a red color. Though some examples of these special cybernetics, known as ultra wear, are things such as complete body uh, replacements or uh implants that allow you to traverse to a sort of semi plane of reality and then pop out of nowhere or things put in the back of your head that you that allow you to essentially control mechanical swarms of bugs like flank scabs that tear through your flesh in extremely dangerous speeds the, ble the bleeding edge kind of kind of wear the bleeding edge exp and the very experimental kind of wear yes the Kind of, kind of like, kind of like all the mechs that Pegasus makes in Lancer. Exactly. You know where, where you're. Uh, you're also, you also mean Horus, not Pegasus. Yeah, Horus. Pegasus is just a mech within within that. Yeah, one of one of their weird one of their weird ass ones. But then again, call calling any of Horus's mechs weird is kind of redundant. An understatement. Yeah, it's only like that. They're very expensive. They're not really meant for like to be easily purchasable. They could be used as MacGuffins or like, oh, this corporation is making that experimental ultraware. Steal it for me or something like that, mm -hmm. and you can install it or something. Yeah. Now, shifting to boons for for a moment, I I I would imagine that there's going to be that there's going to be a fair few, but when it comes to I've whenever it comes to this sort of leveled approach, I've seen some games utilize a uh, a pyramid-like system, where you can where the limitations when it comes to the bo when, one of the main limitations when it comes to acquiring boons is you can't is you can't have more of a higher level than you do of a lower level, which I've nicknamed a pyramid system. Um. But in your case, do you do you mainly do you mainly have it that the um, XP cost for getting boons is de is dependent on whether or not it's one of the starting trees or not? Yeah, you're, uh, it's it's similar to the paths that I mentioned earlier. If your boon species are easier to acquire, uh, your boon species per uh, boon techniques are easier to acquire than those from outside your species. Mm -hmm. Or, or Tenebris, which is the boon that everyone has, even even angels. Uh, boon, uh, boons from all the from all the. Sorry, I stumbled the words. If you're purchasing boon techniques from other boons outside of your outside of Tenebris or your species boon, are a bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. Now, just out of curiosity, do you have plans on making a mission generator? Since 
given. The- uh, we do actually have uh, we do actually have that. We have a whole segment on running the game. It's just not in the preview. Yeah, uh, I was I was curious about that because this is very clearly going to be a game that's that's going to be built around the t- the um, two way step of missions and downtime. Yeah. yeah. Oh, just it's sort of, uh, we, we sort of plan to structure campaigns like a TV series, where it's like the first two sessions, oh, it's a story, nothing much, nothing much, perhaps like a few plot hints, and then the final few episodes, the whole plot comes together. Let me send you a small the table we'll have from the PDF. Ignore some of the purple lines and stuff, these are just rulers that came in with the Adobe Design document. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, this is de- this is definitely within this is definitely within that mo- that motif of a ra- of a random ge- of a random mission generator, um, and would w- would one part of the j- one part of the job generator um, be suggestions on the kind of enemies that that they might find within it? Uh, we don't ha- no, that isn't part of the random job random job generator. It's mostly left out the DM to the GM's hand. It also do- it also largely do- uh, depends on the target. For example, if you're gonna go and say kidnap a gang leader, there's gonna be a lot of gang members. Or if you try to protect a celebrity, it's also probably gonna be gang leader, gang members, or perhaps other mercenaries. Or if you're trying to smuggle a fugitive outside of a city, there's probably gonna be the law on your tail. It's of the GM, in other words. Mm-hmm. But with, because I did, I did see that you do have a small collection of, um, of of in, of encounters, and uh, mo- mostly enemies and stat blocks. Yeah. Though, I sp- though when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to how you have it set up. Um, I did. I did notice that the um sp- the species boons are le- are left up to inter- up to interpretation. Is that going to be carried over into the full book? That is going to be carried over into the full book. And I must also note that again, the preview doesn't have all of the available enemies mm-hmm. slash stat blocks. Only a few. Yeah. There's a lot more, mostly go, mostly animals and other fauna from hell. Yeah. Oh. I think it actually be. I think it actually be interesting to do a crossover between what I see here with with Hellborn and a pro, a project by a um fr, a friend of the temple, Hell Knight. Um, do go on. I'm all ears. <laughs> Hell Knight describes itself as a do- as a doom biker. The tagline that it uses is "It's the Roaring Eighties and Hell has broken loose." Literally, the I, the premise within within that game, which which is done by Gavriel Kurioga, who's an, who is just an awesome guy who keep who unfortunately keeps taunting me with some of the cooking that he puts up. Um, ah. <laughs> He, the idea is is several several high ranking demons ended up ended up getting out of hell and getting on Earth, and if they're if they're not dealt with and put back, that's going to be treated as an act of aggression. By heaven, I assume. Yeah. So so the player characters are are essentially agents who are who are who are sent out sent out on their bikes to find and deal with them. Because it's, e- it's, hmm, de- it's either deal with them or or risk the war co- or, or risk the war coming back on. Honestly, that's a pretty great idea. I would be interested to do a collaboration with him in the future. Mm-hmm. If you can send me his contact details, like his Discord or perhaps a website, I'll probably contact him sooner or later. Um. Yeah, I can. I can certainly do that. Um. Especially, especially given, especially given how, how um, and gra- granted, his stuff is is on the lighter end of crunch, but, give, but given the given the thematic crossovers, I think I think it'd be interesting to work to um bring people together on that front. Plus, that's one of the reasons I have that I have the temple set up. <laughs> I'll I'll make sure to do that. Yeah, the game Hellborn is. 
so decently in between quite crunchy and not very crunchy. Its its system is very it's decently simple, although you have a, a sleuth of options you can pick from. Mm -hmm. One of the things one of the things I prioritized in this game was player choice. Yeah, and that's definitely that's definitely something I can I can see. Um, when it come now. One one particular thing I often ask whenever people have a game that's built that's built on XP based advancement, the XP as currency as I call it, is mm -hmm. if is if they is if they have suggestions for higher for higher tier um, starting points, since that's one thing that a lot of a lot of games have skipped out on. Uh, we do actually have that. Um, I don't remember if we had actually had it in the preview though. That is present in the final version. Mm -hmm. Hold on, let, let me double check. Because I have the InDesign document open right now. No, it's not here, it's a bit more down. Uh, yeah, we do actually have that. Yeah. Because that, that is, that is going to be, imp that is going to be important since some, obviously some tables are, go are going to want to have people play with more advanced characters, especially if their table has already uh, already developed a familiarity with the system. Mm-hmm. Oh. And... I understand, I understand that. I've, I've done that a lot of World of Darkness games. More players want to play, like, Elder Vampires or more Grizzled Hunters. Yeah. Um, I do see that there's the starting equipment um, tiers when it comes to fame, but that's as far as it goes. Oh yeah, uh, about that. We did notice that a bit later, and we did change it, though unfortunately that still remained in the preview version. We have fixed that, that's patched, it's fixed. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, what would what would you say were some of the big um, some of the big lessons that you ended up having in in developing, since it, so it sounds like the game has been rebooted a few times. Well, first and first, when you're an amateur, do not make such a big project. This is a 230-page tome by a studio composed of two people. Never ever do this. We started with a too big project with too many ambitions, although we managed to pull our way, mm. albeit with a few uh, hurdles during development. Mm -hmm. Mostly in the form of burnout. Which is uh, thing, understandable. Yeah, another thing that I learned is that I should not, one should not have to do everything in a project, because you cannot do everything. Mm -hmm. At some point, I thought I had to do the art, the marketing, the writing, the formatting, the editing, and I was just crushed by the weight of having to do everything. You don't have to do that. You can sometimes rely on friends to do the art, or perhaps help you with some of the writing, or you perhaps can contact a friend or a family member to, to do the formatting for you. You don't have to do everything. Else you're just going to burn yourself up. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is completely understandable. Um, hang on. One of the... Uh, a big thing when it comes to any sort of cyberpunk is customization. And not just customi customizing the body but also the kit and i'm curious if when it comes to um weapons in the full book if you have plans on adding some adding some ways of kitting out individual weapon weapons. customization in other ha in other words weapon customization yeah uh the thing is we did actually plan to do that not long ago actually periods and editions of the game did have that have we quickly figured out that it was a bit too complicated to do, and we decided to either either scrap it or put it on the side burner for now. In, instead, what we did was just gave players a lot of options for weapons. Some might seem superficial, but others not so much. Otherwise, no, you can't really customize your weapons, at least not yet. Perhaps in the future, enough supplement, because we do want to expand upon the game, both in the lore aspect and the game, mm -hmm. we could add weapon customization. Yeah. Yeah, I did. But for now, but for now, because it already has a lot of stuff, it has over a hundred perks in total, almost 200 boon, boon techniques in total, and 
a lot of equipment. We didn't want, we didn't want, we did not want to bloat the game even further. Which is f is fair. And I mean, games like Cyberpunk Red did not have weapon customization, as far as I'm aware. Mm -hmm. Or if they did, it's just a very small part of the game. Yeah. It's it's one of the it's one of those things I f I figured I'd I figured I'd ask, um, in in some form because it's it's some it's something that's going to that's go that's going to get brought up. Um, yeah. Now, with with that in with that in mind, um, when it comes. Given given the numerous factions, do you have plans on putting a few NPC examples that are meant to be representatives or the movers and shakers of those factions? Hmm. We do not have we do not have plans for that. Though again, now that you bring it up, it would be a good idea. So we're probably gonna add that. And something that I did find interesting is one of the aspects of character creation you have is the tarot. Um, what prompted you to add that part into the process? Oh, the Tarot. First of all, the Tarot is uh, one of the quintessential occult implements in most games. Uh, no, no, not games, in general, just pagan faiths and in the occult in general. Uh, and during early development, we did want to make a Tarot deck with all the species and archdemons from Hellborn. We still think that we're probably going to do that, Though nothing is certain, but I still don't have that element in the game. We just figured out it's, ni it's nice for flavor, and it also adds a layer of customization that other games don't have. Mm -hmm. It is 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 certainly f um, fair. With and with that in with that in mind. Um, what would you be shooting for as far as the total page count for the project? So, so far, the final version of the book is, let me check, 224. Though, considering we're going to add more art, we're probably going to format a few more of our short stories in there, and a little bit more content, like the aforementioned primer, or perhaps a small segment about the movers and shakers. We are probably around 240 pages? Something, something around that. I can, I can certainly get behind that. And what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, but a general ballpark. Sometime in October. Our, the, the date we want to shoot for is October thirteenth because it's the it's the month of Halloween, and then October thirteenth is also Friday. Okay, Friday the thirteenth. It's all, it's very thematic. Mm -hmm. Though, somewhere around winter to fall of this year is our ballpark estimation. Which certainly is going to make sense. And yeah, everything's finished. There's nothing, there's not much we gotta do except commission some art, some art for the book. Which, we already have artists on board. We're just, we're just, we're, they're just waiting for us to give us the go and to pay them. Mm -hmm. So, with... With all with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Absolutely, I am always happy to share about my work and, of course, have interviews about it. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, once we start, go well. Once we have a Kickstarter for one of our future projects, I'll make sure to hit you up about another interview. Mm -hmm. And of course, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!